Life is pain. Oblivion alone yields peace. You call me stranger. I call myself salvation. The love of a god is not a blessing, it's a scar. If destiny herself beckons me, then I shall greet her like an old lover. There's gotta be more to life than making mistakes and making up for your mistakes. I'm the paragon of risk and reward, behaving is more of a suggestion. Fate is an offer I intend to reject. <laughs> you don't know me. I'm unpredictable, bitch. I don't need to be a paragon to help save the world. I came back for a reason, and I am not stopping until I find it. I will solve the cataclysm, and I'll solve the mystery of myself, too. Four paragons, four keepers, one stranger. Huh. Odds are in our favor. Now let's go save Endake. Everybody, and welcome to Arc 6, Episode 4 of The Second Stranger, which is our main campaign. It's so great to see all of your beautiful, non-existent faces in the chat. As always, I am your game master and creative producer, Connie Chong. My pronouns are they, he, and she. You can find me on Twitter, TikTok, Itch, and Ko-Fi at ByConnieChong. That's B-Y-C-O-N-N-I-E-C-H-A-N-G. I'm going to pass along introductions down and over to Schmerica. Hi, everybody. It's me, Erica. She, her pronouns, and I play V. I've clearly done nothing wrong ever in my life. Not sure, though. And you can find me everywhere I exist on social media at Erica New Girl, including here on Twitch, where I play video games of all kinds. And I will probably say something that I will regret in the morning. So come check out my stream sometime. It's a good time. I promise. And I will pass it on to Humna. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Humna. I use any and all pronouns, and I am a TTRPG performer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at hshahid underscore, where I talk about all of the different projects that I'm a part of. And today I will be playing Jaron Gather, who is having a hard time. Um, I'm just going to pass it along to Austin. Hey, everybody. I'm Austin. My pronouns are he, they, she. Find me on Twitter at saleskadal, that's at sailor, SCT Austin. I am a game, game and narrative designer, performer, player. Lover and best friend. Uh, you can find me over there on Twitter. Like I said, today I play a Biku Ishtar. She's not having a hard time. That's mm. really all I got for that. Connie? Mm. Lies abound. <laughs> Lies abound in the intros, except for Jerron, who's always having a hard time. So yes, if you're tuning in now, you're watching The Second Stranger, which is our main D&D campaign. And as always, Transplaner RPG is an all-transgender, bimpoc-led D&D show set in Andake, an original non-colonial anti-orientalist world. We are very, very proud to keep saying, and have been saying for the past two arcs, uh, that this episode of The Second Stranger is indeed sponsored by at Dimitri Opines on Twitter. That is D-M-I-T-R-Y-O-P-I-N-E-S on Twitter and his company Explain Trade, which is a negotiation skills training consultancy believing in the power of D&D and Transplaner's potential to grow, tell great stories, and lift up our community. Explain Trade, if you don't know what they do by now, trains negotiators for governments, big companies, NGOs, and offers e-learning courses for individuals such as yourselves looking to get a better deal from their boss so check them out at explaintrade.com we love you dimitri yes so as always a big shout out to our patreon paragons these are patrons pledged to our highest tier on patreon we love you so much to azura brookbright bradley charles chiacres cora eckert hat Lex Slater, Marvelous, Mitzi, Moonflower T, Purple Mouse, Risa, and Rue, Scruffusus, and Target. Don't let me forget those last three. And now my favorite part of every episode, Humna. Grandma Urka needs you to explain what last happened on this show. Okay, Grandma, strap in. So last time on The Second Stranger. The Moreau's party set out for Bolshaya in search of leads about the mysterious tapestry depicting the First Stranger War. Tension runs high. I don't know what that's about. Uh, v doesn't trust Jaron for some weird reason. Uh, Abiku tries to stay out of it, and Gentle attempts to broker peace. We love Gentle. And after retrieving directions from the Elder, the Moreau's party heads for the Chromium Order. But wait. 
During their journey, they encounter a familiar copper dragonborn woman with a baby in tow. Does anybody remember arc one? Okay. Uh, use, use exclamation point recap in chat for a full recap. And now I will pass it along to myself for the title of today's episode. Thank you, Humnut. That was very kind. Uh, so as always, <laughs> the titles of our episodes come from lines of poetry written by marginalized creators of all stripes. And today's episode is titled, I Follow the Mirage, from the poem Desertion by Ladon Osman. And the full verse reads as follows. I follow the mirage of a man and his son in a boat. They drift on the shifting dune peaks. They raise their shoulders against the wind. I call to them, my voice a large dog in a crowded yard. Do they also holler at the sun? I have no faculty to hear them. Thank you for that uh, double header, Humna, recap and title. You look at that. Uh, so before we jump right into things, let's get content warnings out of the way. So content warnings for this episode and our campaign in general may include fantasy violence, body horror, gore, monsters and monstrosity, death of loved ones, apocalypse, trauma and grief, familial struggles, medical experimentation, references to torture, complex and complicated relationships, flirting and romance, references to sexual entanglement and open water and heights so uh with that out of the way oh i feel like we should address the blank square in the room dare unfortunately couldn't make this recording today uh but don't worry gentle's fine uh dare's just um there's just gonna be a, a blank square in the corner here hi dare we love you we miss you gentle's doing well they bring united with their dog who hates them so there's, there's a prison constant every Wednesday. Uh, so with that out of the way, let's begin. Twenty days and twenty nights you'd traveled. Asha strapped to your chest, following the scraps of knowledge you'd procured over mugs of elk milk in seedy taverns in the Badlands. All clues led you here. Stranded in the middle of nowhere, the wind blowing its frigid breath down your spine. The journey has worn your shoes down to the thread, though you don't feel the singing pain needling at your feet anymore. Everything feels numb, cold, flat. Everything but Asha, whose eyes look like hers so alive and warm and persistent. You're doing this for them, for her, and you cannot falter. Jaron, Gentle, Abiku, and V. Your sleds slowly approach a hobbled figure on the icy horizon. This dragonborn woman swaddled in furs and hides, leaving a pitiful trail of bloodied footprints in the snow behind her. She cradles a baby close to her chest, swaddled in a uh, denim bjorn. And despite the blood, uh, despite the whipping wind all around her, despite the near freezing temperatures of deep winter, this woman continues to trudge forward, animated by some deep, instinctual motivation. And yes, V, yes, you have indeed seen this woman before. You recognize her almost immediately. What do y'all do? Uh, I think V, recognizing her, would, like, stop would be the wrong answer because she doesn't want people to stop. She wants to get closer. So I think she would yell for who's ever driving her sled, like, bring me closer to this person. Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you know her? It's kind of like a gruff, like, bobsled driver, right? Like a big old, let's say, like a minotaur. I would say that uh, our paths have crossed before. I, and I think V would be, like, looking for Rev, like, you remember the first night of the Cataclysm? Like, this was one of the people in, in the Butte that I was telling you about. What? One of those yeah, this... dragon cult people? Yes! Oh. One of the dragon cult people. Uh, you heard her at once. Uh, Wait, this is yeah. one of the members. This is one of the members of the Chromium Order. No, no. Uh, the there's this other order called that we met the night of the, when everything went down. The the, the copper stewards. This 
This is a different group. I, I don't know why she, she's here, but we were defending her from all those monsters that showed up on Adolin a year ago. What about the rest of the, you said copper stewards. What, what about the rest of them? Where are they? I don't know. She should be with them. You said she looks hurt. You said you said you see like blood trailing her. Yes, like like her shoes. So Abiku, I think let's say you're on a different sled. Maybe you're with Gentle, mm-hmm. right? And like Jaron mm-hmm. and V are in the same sled. Mm-hmm. Uh, much to maybe both of their discontent. Uh, and <laughs> you do notice that this trail of bloody footprints leading up to the backs of her souls. Because I think you got like a nat twenty on your perception check. Yeah, um, I like I yeah. saw into the ether. Yeah, you, you saw into her soul. Uh, yeah, her she has shoes on, but she's it looks like she's been walking for a long time and hasn't stopped. So like the shoes have been worn down uh, to like expose her bare feet, and yeah, it's rough snow, have, so uh, she's bleeding. Uh, I think Abiku thinks the sled's too slow and starts and gets off and starts running. Okay, <laughs> okay. Abiku, you hop off the sled and you start sprinting toward this woman. And I think this is happening while Jaron and V and Rem are catching each other up, right? And like the Minotaur goes, mush, mush, right? And the dogs start running. Uh, and Abiku, because of this, I think you're the first person to get to her. Uh, mm-hmm. This copper dragonborn woman, as soon as she senses your presence coming up on her, she sort of like turns around a little bit as she's still like hobbling and stumbling and staggering through the snow. And you see mm-hmm. that her like dark brown uh, skin is sort of like flushed red with just like exertion. Her breath is coming out mm-hmm. in these like thick, dense clouds. Like her dark mm-hmm. brown hair is matted to her forehead with sweat. Uh, you look like you. May I help you? Please. Oh. Uh, Hi, hi there. Um, and her voice is trembling with cold. It also sounds hoarse, like she hasn't spoken to anyone in days. Yeah. Hello, yes. Oh, uh, sleds. I'm so sorry. Could I trouble you? Do you think my baby yes. and I could travel with yes, you? Yes, of course. Yes, please. I may I, and I like kind of just to like pick her up because I see her feet are bleeding. <laughs> oh. Oh, no, please, you don't have, you don't have to. But she, like, I, uh, like okay. leans against you. Even though she's resisting yeah, I, with her words, she, like, leans against I you. I pick up, hurry, she needs help. And at this point, the rest of the sleds have caught up. I think as we're approaching, V's actually taking off her coat and will, like, cast a sorcery point to use her draconic resilience against the cold. So, like, the cold doesn't bother her much. But so she's taking off her jacket. And so when she arrives, she is ready to, like, sort of swaddle up um, this woman in it. Um... And I think V would like, do you remember me? <sighs> right, as like Abiku's like scooping her up and she's holding her child close to her chest. The sleds arrive, the dogs are here, more body heat starts swirling around this icy field. You throw off your cloak. She looks up at you and her eyes sort of furrow and you see recognition glimmer in her pupils. Veronica. Yes, Veronica, you can just call me V, just just V works. Wh- where, where's the rest of your... How did you... Why are you... Uh, that's a long, long story. We should get you someplace Wait, wait, warmer. wait, wait. You're, you're the paragon of Scott and Nectus, right? Everything that happened in, in Rosso. I heard about it. All of us did. Oh, uh, wow. News travels fast. Yes, yes. Um, I am the paragon of, of risk and reward, Scott and Nectus, at your service. Oh, thank you for this jacket. Uh, well, you you remember Asha? Asha, say hello. And she sort of <laughs> tilts her, her infant baby like forward. And you see like a very like a dead asleep child just sort of like swaddled up, maybe less than a year old, just sort of asleep, like dozing. Baby looks totally fine. The, the, your child has gotten so big since, you know, oh, a year ago. Yes, yes. Well, I have to save you this... Feels like fate. Oh, thank you. Thank you all so much. Might I ask where you're headed? Do you mind giving us a, giving us a lift? We were heading. I think V is kind of like looking to the rest of the group about how much do we say? Where do you need to go? I'm, I just, I don't know. But all I do know is that my wife, you remember my wife, Tamba? Very muscular, shouted at you, lifted doll up by the front of his, you know, denim apron. Uh, my, my, my wife, she's, um, 
she's gone. I think she's been kidnapped. And I, I think I think she's around here somewhere. Have you heard anything about who may have done that to her? I, I don't. It was such. We were just. This was two weeks ago. Half a month ago, we were just in the butte as usual. Everything was fine, and then some miscreants came knocking around the butte. They they got past Milo and Milo and all of us except Tomba. We we went to you know the back room with the dais. You remember? Uh, we huddled there. Uh, we we were safe, and all I could over here were just whispered snatches of words from Tomba and these goons that came knocking down our door and everything quieted down and when we dared to peek our heads out into the hallway she was gone and so were they I think they took her oh boy I think V's like having a thought you just see a quick bubble back to when V gave Trenchfoot all this information about where the copper stewards were a few arcs ago oh man come on come on <laughs> Uh, Beak Beak would ask, uh, can you describe your wife to me? I might be able to help. Um, do do any of you have mind reading magic? Maybe I'll just remember. I I can't. I'm sorry. I'm just, 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 I can share this with you. You do not want me. You do not want me in your mind. (laughs) Do you say that out loud? I am told I am very broken, so it should not be me. I can... I've got detect. I can detect people's thoughts and see sort of in their mind. If yes, you yes. would like that, please, please. And she All like right. leans her forehead forward to offer you. V kind of like just place, even though she doesn't have to. She sort of like, did she actually say her name yet? Because I feel like uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, she hasn't reintroduced herself to you, uh, but she remembers you, right? <laughs> right. Uh, so V will just take this person's, um, he- head in her hands. Uh, I don't, I feel like V never really intro- got introduced to this person by name. But, so V's trying to dance around that a little bit. So she takes, uh, her head in her hands and, uh, sort of bows her own head and, and casts Detect Thoughts. Okay. You cast the tech thoughts as sort of like dropping a uh, needle onto the surface of a pond. Her memories sort of waver and ring out from that like lance that you gently nuzzle into her consciousness. And you hear, I think, swirling voices like the the entirety of the snowy field drops out. And you are now, I think, inside a uh, chamber. A rocky chamber with these like rough stone floors, flickering torchlight all around, and voices echoing down a corridor, right? This feels like like a super like jagged, terrified, almost like traumatic memory. Like this is this woman trying to remember something that terrifies her, uh, but she's plowing onward for you. And you hear a familiar voice ringing down the corridor, the voice of Tamba, uh, the high steward, right? This muscular half-elf woman who sort of shook Dalapati Saeed down, saying, just leave my family alone. And you hear another voice, an unfamiliar one, a little bit more shrill, go, but your child. And she cuts in again. I didn't sire Asha, okay? I'm not a fool. Just take me, leave my family alone. And the rest of the voices like overlap and they grow faint and you you can't catch anything else, right? Uh, But with that, I think you're pulled out of this like easy skim of detect thoughts. That, that's all I really remember. That's all I could recollect. I was so scared and, and panicked. Those were the only words I recall. The, um, sort of like audibly for everyone, half elf, muscular, very strong. Um, and I think V is caught by, um, the comment, and I think she'll actually say, just like repeat it out loud, like, Tomba didn't sire that child. And like, cause that's V just like retaining information for herself after like coming out of her mind. Mm-hmm. Um, v like kind of needs a moment to, and like looks to everybody else like, while she's like getting her thoughts back together. It's, I... it's true. This, I mean, this Asha is Tomba and mine's, but bi- biologically we used, we used a donor. And I, I think- might be able to try something. If I can go put, uh, go put you down on the sled for a moment. Oh, yeah, yes, of course. 
So I'll, I'll put her down. I'm going to go try a thing so someone else can talk to her. Um, I want to try locate creature. I don't know if that's enough for it to try and work, but I'm going to I'm going to give it the old college try. What is the range? It's on a thousand that? feet. OK, <laughs> OK. Roll Arcana. I shall do that. 16. <laughs> well oh, done. A 16. With you a 16. Know what, the DC is. what does locate creature look like when you attempt to cast it? Uh, I think I go over and I, I like pick up some snow and I ask the winds to show me where to go and I like blow the snow out of my hand. Mm, that's beautiful. Have inspiration back for that. So, Abiku, as you cup some <laughs> snow him. in your palms and you blow, usually Locate Creature would, the snow or whatever aspect of nature you're communing with, would pick up off the ground and show you in no uncertain terms exactly where that creature is. Yeah. But you get the sense that wherever Tamba is, is out of the range of your like, magic's influence. But the snow shows you the direction due north. Okay. I will I'll be belay that to the group when I walk back over. Okay, but before you do that, while while you're casting the spell, let's zoom back to Jaron and V. I just have a question for the GM. Is the Chromium Order due north? Yes. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, so when Abiku put the woman down onto the sled, I think Jaron would have knelt down beside her and started rifling through uh, their pouch and pulled out a salve that he has been working on, actually. And he uh, looks at this woman very softly and says, I'm Jaron. Uh, May I? Your feet, they're bleeding, and I think I can help. Oh, oh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd really appreciate that. Of course. And they will take this salve and start like rubbing it into uh, the woman's feet and mechanically speaking Jaron is casting cure wounds on on this woman so that ideally her feet stop bleeding so I think the way that this specific salve works is that it is designed to sort of close up any like gaping wounds and uh, has like maybe like pain relieving properties to it as well Mm, mm, I'm really into that, yeah. So, uh, but yeah, as you r rub the salve on the bottoms of her bloodied feet, you see, like, the flesh begin to stitch itself over. She stops actively bleeding, you know, and, like, a thin film of skin appears on the open sore. Like, like you've expedited a week or two of healing with your magic. It's it's 1d8 plus spellcasting mod. I rolled a 1, so she gets back 6 HP. <laughs> okay. Uh, two weeks of healing. That's that's it. Right. You're new. You're new to this. Jira yeah, I was gonna say Jaron is still new. They're still learning how to cast magic. So at least you didn't kill her. That's true. At least you didn't kill her. We're making progress here. Yep. Yeah. She <sighs> lets out a content sigh as like the healing magic starts to take root in her foot, and she like continues to sort of like cradle like this baby to her chest, and you know, baby sound asleep looks like super comfortable, like nestled in all, all these bundles. Yes, um, Tamba was very insistent on um using a donor. Actually, actually, funny enough, uh, Verona V, uh, it was Dalapathy. Really? Yes. That's why you know. During the donor application process, uh, Dalapathy stood out to us because, you know, of all his stories of being such a great adventurer, and also he's a talented midwife, so we thought perhaps he could help us deliver the child, but then he shirked on that promise nine months later, so we had to send some people to get him, and then you came and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. <laughs> right. You can never know who you trust these days. It's hard to find a good donor, am I right? Am I right? Uh... Oh, um... Are you trying to have a baby? No, definitely not. This is, it's a strange time in a decade to maybe bring a child into this world. Uh, it's true, I think there's, it's true. there's enough bees in this world for all of Endake. I think Jaron, like, raises an eyebrow at V and just kind of, like, smiles and then looks back and maybe starts, like, playing with the baby a little bit and, like, as he's just kind of uh, just playing with the baby, he'll, not looking at this woman, ask, do you know any reason why somebody might have wanted to come after your family? 
The only reason I can think of is if they're... If they wanted Tomba, they probably want to know Amurai the Copper's location. Something like that. Mm -hmm. And does Duran know what that means? Roll history. Ah, 15. I 15. Well. Amurai the Copper. You don't recognize that exact title, but you recognize the structure of the title. Blank the blank, right? Uh, this is likely a dragon. So dragons of yore were referred to by, like, description. Like, they'd have a name like Zalam the White, right? Amurai the Copper, right? It's sort of like a historical way of giving a title or an epithet to someone in various draconic orders. So that's where it rings a bell. Hearing that, I think Jaron kind of, like, stills and looks up at this woman. Amurai the Copper, like, a dragon? <sighs> well... Usually we keep this a tight-lipped secret, but I'm desperate for help, and V, you've helped us before. I don't know where the rest of your party is, uh, but are they okay? As far as I know, they're tip-top. You know, we've taken some licks, but it uh, turns out everyone who was there who helped you uh, are all paragons. What? Well you, well, you gotta tell me more about that later, but to answer your question, Jaron, uh, yes. Us, I'm a member of the Copper Stewards. Our entire life's purpose is to protect the secrets and the <clears throat> livelihood of Amurai the Copper, the last surviving dragon in all of Andake. You're saying that a dragon exists right now, is living, yes. Yes. breathing, yes. has a heartbeat. Yes. I, I've never seen her personally. Uh, only Tamba has, my wife. She's the high steward. Um, the rest of us are not yet worthy to lay our eyes upon Amurai the Copper. But, um, yes. Where... I suppose I'm not allowed to ask that question, but... Where exactly does Amurai live? I mean, a dragon is kind of hard to hide from the world, no? You're absolutely right. But, you know, as the myths say, dragons can walk and dake in people form. So, she could be anyone. Does it seem like this woman believes what she's saying? A hundred percent. Or is she trying to lie to me? No, you don't even need to make an inside check. She, this is a true believer. Through okay. and through. I think the name finally does pop into V's mind. Like, <gasps> Najwa, that's... Yes, uh, uh, yes, uh, everyone, this is uh, Najwa, hello, uh, everyone. This, um, I, I just want to say to you that when I first met you, I thought you uh, perhaps weren't the most, maybe you just weren't being truthful about your relationship to dragons, but this seems, like you said, a little strange that uh, we're, uh, um, I've been searching for perhaps my father who may or may not be a dragon of the but, Chromium but Order that's, variety. Well, that's impossible, because only one dragon exists. Still, Amurai the Copper. You know... As far as I know, she only uses she, her pronouns that I don't think would identify as a father, so... I mean, I could be wrong, but I... I don't think so. <laughs> How do you know... If... Not to be disrespectful of... Tamba! Or the High Steward! Or anything... Not she, she, the existence of Amurai, but how do you know that other... If Amurai the Copper is still alive, how do you know that other dragons aren't? Well, according to Tamba, who has, of course, spoken to Amurai the Copper directly, she's the only one left. Or she thinks. One, one of the few. Well, there's... We haven't... We haven't met any other dragons or any other stewards or anything like that, so... There used I mean, to be more of us. If the copper stewards are such a well-kept secret, who's to say that other orders don't similarly keep things under wraps? That's a good point. Well, that's that's a philosophical discussion for later. I'm I need to find my wife. She's somewhere out here, I think. I've just been walking for days and days in a straight line. I feel like I might come upon the edge of Zima Lake soon. I, I walk back over. <clears throat> um, she is north, and I look at the two of you. Really? North? She is. The winds do not lie. Do, do you know where exactly she is? Do you know who's taken her? 
No, I can try again tomorrow to see if we are closer, but they tell me to go north, so we go north. But here's here's the deals. We actually, uh, ironically enough, are also traveling north, but however, it may not be the safest situation for someone who's protecting a small child. Maybe uh, it would be best. And I think V's like sort of mapping out, like seeing the sleds that they have and thinking like, can we send Najwa back on one sled back towards Bolshea or, uh, and get by with one sled? Uh, you definitely can, right? The multiple sleds was for your comfort. You could probably all fit on one. Uh, but Najwa goes, I, I've come this far and I, I know it's dangerous out here, but my wife, I, I mean, uh, I am exhausted. Like but... a hand on her shoulder. You have a child. You cannot do this. We, and I gesture all of us, we do things like this. You watch them. Okay. Okay. I've tried to... I don't have any money. I, I can't... I spent don't. all my money trying to get here. I... Don't worry about it. And I think he actually takes out ten gold pieces and puts it in Nashua's hand. When you get to where you're going, I'm sure they will take care of you. They're very lovely people. Even if you just say that uh, that we sent you, uh, they'll take good care of you. But if you need anything, take these. And oh. we will find Tomba for you uh, if she is north. And uh, we will we will bring her back to you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please, please do. And when you see her say, say Najwa says hello and Asha's doing okay and... She loves you, and thank you, thank you. I'll I'll go back to Bolshaya then, I think, with this sled, and I'll stay there and wait until the four of you come back with her. Please. When you, when you go to Bolshaya, ask for Elder Pohaku, and I'm sure that they will be able to help you. Thank you, Jaron. Thank you. I am exhausted. I know this was foolish to bring Asha here, but... I mean, the rest of the stewards tried to stop me, but I slipped out in the middle of the night. It's a long story. You don't have to know all the details. Um, all right then. I suppose we'll be on our way back to Bolshaya, and, um, please find Tamba and bring her back safe. We will do everything we can. Thank you. Ah. Oh. And for the first time in, it seems like a long ass time, this exhausted looking dragonborn woman just sort of slumps in the sled, right? Like against like a pile of like crates and holds her baby close to her body. And I imagine that before Najwa sets off, um, Jaron would give her some of their rations so that she has food to eat. And I imagine Gentle would probably also want to give like some teas that yeah, like, definitely. they brewed as well. So uh, she would be at least maybe not entirely comfortable, but at least like doing better on the physical front. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I like, like that. tuck her in with her cloak too. Oh, thank you. Uh, aren't you going to be cold? You're barely wearing anything. Oh, that's, that's fine. Um, I, I do well in the cold. Huh. And you look a little different now that I think of it. Since the last time I saw you, those scales, they used to be so prominent. Yeah, I've... Let's just say that uh, when one contains the god shards of Scott and Nectus, strange things seem to happen all the time. <sighs> all right. All right, Asha, we're going back to Bolshaya. We'll see Mommy again soon. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I think this one sled peels off, right, with this, like, driver going, mush, right? Oof. They, like, turn around and start going back toward the capital, leaving the four of you with just, I think, two sleds remaining. Let's say there were three total previously. Jaron will turn to the group and with this worried look on his face. So, you said north, right, Apiku? Yes. We're heading north. Yes. I. V, do you know anything about the Chromium Order and their feelings towards the Copper Stewards? Do we think this order took the wife? Yes. So here's the thing, back in, uh, back at the, in Ducal, I may have told somebody the address of where the copper stewards are, because they stiffed me on a payment. <laughs> you know, I was petty, v? my pettier. What? Did you send them to kidnap somebody? No, no. Wait, you're behind this, V? 
No, I said, we met this person named Trenchfoot, who, ironically enough, was the one who sent me to where these copper stewards ended up being. I mean, they didn't send me directly there, but they sent me on what would become my journey towards the copper stewards. And we rescued them from these creatures and they said they would pay us. They paid me in these Nectus coins instead of the 500 gold pieces they promised me, which actually, you know what? Those coins actually ended up being helpful, but that's long story short. So I, you screwed over a group that was actually helpful to you. Look, I used to be a lot pettier, okay? I'm trying to change. And yet you can't give me the same grace for the same thing. Hey, my decision yet has not gotten anyone killed. Yet. I, we, we technically do not know that. We don't know what they did to this to Tum, Tumba, yes? Seems like Tumba. they took her alive. So why would they take her alive just to kill her? somewhere else doesn't make sense so there's a high possibility she's still alive but we we have to get her as soon as possible it's another mess v that you've created that we will clean up like i said yesterday we're in this together right so yes i did you not see i gave her my cloak i gave her money i'm going to go try to help i'm yes we're doing the right thing this time we're taking care of it uh, we don't even know if the Chromium Order has Tomba. It's just an educated guess right now. We're just guessing. Uh, so we'll keep an eye out. If we see a half-elf muscular woman somewhere in there, we know that, uh, this could be Tomba, and we should help her out and rescue her. Five gold that the Chromium Order has Tomba. Did you, did you tell us what you heard when you did Detect Botsby? You said you, you were saying it all out loud, right? Yes, you yeah. was, was saying yeah. it all out loud, yeah. Why Why would they want the child if Tamba was sired them? Why, why would that matter? Well, um, I can say that the Chromium Order, Sievert, particularly was trying to get my blood back in the ball. Your blood? Why? Whoa, wait, oh, I think I have an idea. This isn't like that time where Oka tried to get my blood, is it? No, I don't know what that means. Um, if so, you think your dad is a dragon? Yes. All signs point to yes, maybe. What if Tamba's dad is also a dragon? So then they think that this child Asha is it a dragon. It would make sense if, they, if that's the whole thing, right? Maybe they think they can find. I'm losing me my, my idea. The first part well, was good. Oh, Oka has used blood to locate people before, so that's not a terrible yes, conclusion. Yes, they have. They they were able to locate Sitvali in the nothing plane using just. just Can we just blood. call up Oka and ask how to do it? We have a scrying bowl, right, Jerome? We should. Yes. Yes. Uh, maybe maybe someone someone else should call them. Oh. Yeah, that, that, you're, that's probably a good idea. Do we still have ourselves some some extra blood, or we gotta provide some fresh samples? Is oh yeah, Oka gave me some can, uh, no. at Doctor Luzos, and Rev reaches into her. <laughs> the both, both the people in Toronto are like ready to go, and Rev's like. No. Also, like all the undead people were like, "Oh, I'll call up." I was like, "Wait a second, does that work?" Is that work? <laughs> uh, Rev takes out a, vi a dusty vial of Oka's blood that she had t gotten from Oka during, you know, while they were resting at Doctor Luso's, uh, and I think while the sled is going, pulls out the silver scrying bowl and like sets it carefully like across her lap, uncorks the vial and splashes it in. Right, and we see Oka's like crimson liquid sloshing around the interior of the silver bowl. <laughs> And Rev begins to like mutter like some arcane words under her breath and like sort of twists her hands. And she also says sort of as an aside, Ugh, necromancy. Ugh. Uh, shudders a little bit to herself, twists her uh, wrist one last time and all of you see the surface of the blood tighten and then shimmer uh, like it usually does right before it calls someone's face. And then it shimmers and then it begins to bubble. Like the surface of it begins to boil almost. Like, it's like water being put over fire. Uh, B? 
<clears throat> did you Excuse do it me. right? Yeah, I did. I know. I, I did it all right. I'm not. <clears throat> and oh, Rev, like, give, give it to me. Maybe maybe the blood is just old. And uh, Jaron will take the bowl, pour out the blood off the side of the sled. What the fuck, Jaron? It might it might need fresh blood. Oka always uses fresh blood. And uh, Jaron will hold the bowl already, over. Like, you need fresh blood. Over Abiku's hand. <laughs> As yeah, Ibiku bleeds into the bowl. What? That was perfectly good blood. I, whatever. That's a weird word. That's a weird sentence. You should rephrase that. Well, it's not like I can bleed, so I'm useless in this regard. Uh, as Ibiku squeezes her fist and some blood dribbles. Ibiku's like, I, yep. I don't know how this is working for me, then. This is, like, you, your heart beats, my heart does not. The, the, I know, but I don't have blood, don't and know, you have blood. It's weird. Coming from. I'm not sure. Yeah, we have to. We should figure that out later. Uh, is it working? And Rev looks as the blood dribbles into the silver bowl, right? And Rev goes, anyway, let me try. Uh, and does the same incantation, right? Like it shimmers, it shimmers, it shimmers. And then the surface begins to bubble. And then Jaron just tips it over the side again. Stop. Okay, maybe what? it's because of Biku, you're, un you're undead. You're not actually alive. And then cuts himself. Um, and bleeds into the bowl. Okay, this time, it's fresh, I'm alive. For, for now. now. Right. Nice. And Rev puts her hand up for a high five for V. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you squeeze your, your fist like an orange uh, into the bowl and it fills up with your own blood, Jaron. Rev does the same thing. The incantation, the surface shimmers, shimmers, and then bubbles. Maybe the bowl is broken? Jaron is going to run their hands along the bowl with their prosthetics specifically. And I think like little uh, runes start to appear on his fingers as he does so, as he has to detect magic on the bowl, just to check what the heck is going on with this bowl. So Jaron, right before the blood in a single fell swoop erupts up in a column of flame and then evaporates into dust right before that you detect the magic surrounding it which it is what now? which is all schools of magic chaotically running into each other shattering and smashing against each other and imploding okay i know that i'm new to this whole weave thing, but magic is not supposed to be all of the magic at once, right? Does no, it what the it fuck does? was that? No, it doesn't. Jerron, what did yeah, you do? I didn't do you anything. I... The spell. Yeah, but... <laughs> hey, I didn't, I didn't mess up the spell. It's worked every single other time I've done it. Every single other time. I... I, I detected the magic in the bowl, and it was all of the schools of magic all at once and that can't be right right what? and like Jaron looks over at v right yeah no there's this is not working as maybe it's just no maybe it's out of order maybe, wait v you can you someone else do you know no, sending... you're not getting my you're not getting my sweet delicious dragon blood trust me <laughs> <laughs> we played that game before no v darling honey do you know the spell sending? No, I fortunately <sighs> I do not. I only I've, I've got I can do messaging. This, <sighs> I mean, I've been getting better and better at my teleportation and. <gasps> Wait, and I think Jaron has like a moment where he remembers back when the hounds were looking for Oka and they had Unmei's water. Something similar happened once, and that was. While um, Oka was in the carnival above table, yeah, above table. Yeah. While Oka was in the carnival, Unmei's water was unable to detect where they were, and similarly, the water like spiraled and then shot up, in kind of a similar way to what the blood just did right now. I mean, it didn't explode into flames, but so Jaron remembering that will turn to V and uh, who was there the last time that we were trying to track Oka and couldn't. In a similar way, they were in the carnival. I think that's what they called it. You were there with them, right? Yes. What if something like that is happening again? It's very possible. I mean, I don't think Dr. Aluso has ever really told, mentioned to me anyway about what's going on in Jukai. It's called the stagnation. 
uh, rivers stop flowing, evolution stops occurring, nature stops growing, everything just slows down like molasses. At least that's how Dr. Luso explained it to me. Okay, so what does that have to do with being on a different plane? That's still here, right? That's... Well, maybe, maybe it's like the carnival? Uh, some sort of pocket dimension or time, space, warp thing? The god shards can do a lot of strange things, I mean... That they can. We need to find a way to contact them. We need to find a way to make sure they're okay. Why? What, what do you mean, why? What if they need our help? How will we get? I mean, I I won't lie. I don't have a map. I'm not. I have not done very good just remembering places up. Aren't we very far from them? If they needed help, wouldn't it be too late? We, we are, are, but teleportation is a thing. We have the the deuses. We can. Uh, Jaron, I th I think we. I agree with Ibiku, Actually, they have Doctor Luso, Sitlali, Oka, Dewey. They're all very competent. They know what they're doing. Okay, we have to just, we have to trust them. And plus, Vaska's there too, and she's also a paragon. You're right. You're right. We have to focus on the mission at hand. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They'll be okay. They have, what, like four paragons there this time? Exactly. Be... Yeah. Way too many for you to try and kill, anyway. So, um, <clears throat> let's just uh, focus on getting to the Chromium Order, yeah? Jaron yeah. just gives Rev a look. Look, I agree. Like, wherever, whatever's happening, they'll take care of it. We have to believe that they'll be fine. And again, these these god shards can wreak havoc on reality as we know it. Uh, Scott and Nectus, again, ripped out my heart for the fun of it. So, you know, we'll just, we'll, we'll trust and that they'll be fine. They'll, when they, when Oka gets sent, all of that will go away in, in Jukai. Just like everywhere else. I trust Oka. They know what they're doing. Yeah, uh, me too. So, shall we move forward towards the Chromium Order? Yep. All right, uh, I'm gonna check on the, uh, I'm gonna check on the dogs. Uh, says Rev as a way to extricate herself from this conversation. She sort of like <clears throat> muscles past Jaron, goes up to where the uh, the driver of the dogs is, right? Uh, and is there anything that the rest of you would like to do before we enter a travel montage? Yes, Jaron. I think um, as everybody is kind of separating out, Jaron would sidle over to V and kind of like in a lower voice and kind of hushed tones. <clears throat> and maybe also in Question, does V speak Jukan, given that she's from there, or no? Yeah. Okay. Uh, then in Jukan as well, to try and add, like, an extra layer of privacy uh, to this conversation. <clears throat> v, um, I trust Oka, that they're okay, but you mentioned that you have Scott and Nectus, right? Um, they are the ones who created the carnival. Would it be is maybe a lot to ask, but would it be okay if I, at some point, not right now, spoke to them? Just to ask questions about the carnival, just to... It would just help me to know what exactly Oka might... And Sitlali, what they might be experiencing right now. What they might be up against. V looks at Jaron for quite a bit. And um, hearing Jaron speak Jukai, V immediately thinks of the other day with the elder when she spoke Jukai and uh, about mercy. And all of a sudden, like her V's like, wheels are turning. Oh, crap. He understood what I was saying. Oh, shit. Uh, that's, a, that's internal. That's internal thoughts. And uh, externally, I think V is, is looking at Jaron and thinking, I don't think that would be a very good idea um you know these gods inside of me they're not they're not toys to be played with they uh asking for favors can get you into a lot of trouble cut to like memory of like impressing lotus with scott and nectus flashback uh so you know um 
push. I mean, what do you need to know? It was, it was illusions. They create a bunch of illusions that trapped people in their in what they thought they wanted. That's, that's all you need to know. I think V is just like. She, you clearly get the feeling from V that she's like uncomfortable and like does just she doesn't want you to, and she's like making up bullshit excuses. You don't need to roll insight on that. She's like, this is the worst you've probably seen V lie ever. Yeah, no, I don't want to push. I understand that the carnival wasn't pleasant um, for you, for for any of you, uh, as you were in there. I just thought maybe getting the finer details about the the magic and the, the boundaries, maybe we could, I don't know, figure out a way to contact them. But I don't want to. Look, it's, don't consider this me like thinking you're all fine and cool with me because you're not. But I just want to let you know that not everything needs to a solution. You, there are sometimes you won't get answers to all things. It's okay not to know. Just have faith that Oak is going to get through this. And you know what? If everything happens with the Chromium Order, and if, let's say you somehow save my life, just, if you do something incredible that impresses me, how about I will let you have this conversation? Okay. That seems like a fair deal. And v now v I just need to figure hand. out a way to... Put you in danger so that I can save your life. Oh, don't worry. I'll, fi I'll find my own way. I'm good at that. <laughs> I'm sure you will. <sighs> okay. And uh, Jaron will take V's hand and shake it. Don't worry. I'm not putting you under a contract right now. <laughs> oh, yeah, gosh. No more contracts <laughs> for me, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, okay. And I think on that... We are going to cut to a timely travel montage to tie up the rest of the journey to the headquarters of the Chromium Order itself. I think this next scene finds us in a flurry of snow as a gentle mist of snowfall dapples across, I think, this, this camp uh, that your party has built against the side of a low hill, a rocky hill with some stalagmites licking out of the ground around you, uh, a bonfire burning in, nestled against various rocks, twigs, and scavenged lumber that your party has managed to find. Uh, the flickering flames dance against uh, the rugged stalactites, uh, causing shadows to sort of like metamorph foes across the rocky ground. And snowfall melts as soon as it comes into contact with the heat licking off of the wood. Uh, but beyond the confines of your tent is just pure darkness, howling wind, and snow. And it's amidst this fiery camp that we find a biku. A biku. Where are you sitting in camp, and what are you up to? Abiku is sitting on the edge of camp. It, it, playing with snow, I think, is the best way to describe it. Um, she is like sifting through. She's like sifting through snow to see if she can find uh, any kind of plant life. Mm. I think your fingers, cold and dead as they are, still feeling the biting sting of ice and winter frost uh, sift through this powdery layer of snow to find a little sprout uh, peeking up through hardened, cracked, frozen earth uh, that settled above the lake itself underneath your feet. And I think she's, she sits there for a bit and she thinks about talking to it. And she's like, and starts looking for V instead. Mm. And I think as you turn, right, trying to find your other party member, V, is that when we find you? Yeah, I think V uh, has been staying close to the fire because she's still without a cloak. So she's like, she's been having to drain her sorcery points throughout the day to stay warm. So when there's fires to be had, she loves to curl up. But I think she's been watching Abiku playing in the snow and it's like obviously seems to have found something. And but like V can't tell from as far away she is, so I think V eventually is like stands up, walks over, like a biku. Are are you? Did you have you found something? Oh, I found a little plant. I was going to talk to it because I am more used talking to plants and birds than people. 
I Maybe. think I want to talk to a person. Oh, oh, well, okay. Um, I think I'm a person. Do you want? Would you like to talk to me? Yes. Okay. So, I I've not thought about it for a long time until we saw that woman today. But I just wonder about my parents. You know. That's relatable. I've been thinking a lot about my parents recently as well. It's just hard because, like, I know that anyone I knew is probably not around anymore. Or if they are around, like, we may have to worry about them because I, I know Rev's like some people that get brought back onto good people. So who, who knows if we find anyone I knew, if it'll be good or not. But I don't know. I've just been thinking a lot about parents and 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 kids and stuff you know kids yes um that subject seems fresh lately um but abiku i maybe i might find my father in all of this maybe but uh i lost my mother a very very long time ago many birthdays ago um and i've gotten most Oh, thank you. It was a long time ago, but um, when she passed away, I was kind of angry with her, and I had some very negative thoughts towards her. And now with everything, all of this, I've come to realize that uh, maybe she was actually right about a lot of things that I thought she wasn't. So, you know, we have complicated relationships with parents uh, whether they're here or not here and it's okay to feel those complicated feelings towards them I don't know I used to think everyone else was so lucky because I knew their parents and and then I thought they weren't lucky because like you say some people have weird feelings with their parents but I, I don't know I go back and forth on if I want to know who they were or not because I don't have to have a whole thing if I don't know them, right? You know? But I don't know how I could know what's good to do or not if I don't know who they were and what they did for me. Well, this is kind of why it's so important that if my father does exist and if he might be some way associated with this Chromium Order, you know, I want to find out so that You know, there's a lot of prophecy that maybe the Paragons, myself included, we might be dying uh, when we fight the stranger. And so, like, I kind of want to, like, get that all settled before before I do dive. If this is it for one Vasante Nakshurza. That makes sense. And I'll make sure if he's here that we'll find him. But... Have you ever thought about what you do if the prophecy is wrong? And, uh... Suddenly I find myself with a thriving business and two wives I love very much and some good friends I made out of all of this chaos. Uh, have I thought about it? Sure. Does it feel healthy for me to hold too tightly to that image? It hurts too much to think about if I believe that that is possible and then the opposite happens I'd rather believe in in that I'm going to die and maybe maybe I'll get lucky maybe risk and reward will be on my side but if it comes down to anyone dying when we face the stranger I'd I would rather it be me than any one of you or the paragons or lotus that makes sense I I would die to protect people too, so I can understand that, but I will respect if you want it to be you, and I will hold on to your hope for you in the meantime. It's not that I'm hoping for it, but, you know. Well, no, but you you don't want to think about the other one, so I'll make sure to do that for you. So if it does happen, you don't forget. I think we... Uh, all of a sudden, Biku maybe can see that V's chest is breathing in a way that isn't probably something she, 
Abiku is familiar with seeing, and you can see like tears like start to cry, and then like it's it's an interesting sensation because of the, how cold it is. It like oh, you almost freezes, but then because of how warm uh, V's draconic resilience is, it does like sort of just like evaporate off. So it's like this weird like sensation of seeing like a crystallization and just evaporate of tears. Did I do something wrong? Abiku, you are so so good. I don't know what has brought you back, but you are so incredible. Oh, I I mean I I am trying, but I I know I did a lot wrong before, and I just want to make sure I don't do it again. Me too. And I think on that, maybe the snow thickens a little bit, uh, giving both of you an excuse perhaps to go back to camp soon. Uh, and I think we see the two of your silhouettes like flicker from like the campfire, looking up, up, up into the atmosphere, hungry tongues of flame reaching up toward the darkness through the howling wind. And we cut now to yet another day of travel, the dogs panting, uh, their drivers mushing, right? The sleds skidding over smooth and bumpy rock and snow and ice and frost-licked boulders rising up through the darkness uh, all around the early daybreak uh, in this atmosphere. And I think the next scene we find is perhaps not at night, but perhaps during a lunch break, uh, sort of huddled against, I think, like a... a cavernous overhang. Uh, this is very deep north, by the way, at this point. You are, like, miles and miles off from, like, the nearest town. Like, this is, like, we're in peak Morosan wilderness. Even, like, the most seasoned hunters rarely venture out this far, uh, even when game is difficult to find around Bolshaya. And here we just sort of see just, it's just this flat expanse of Zima Lake all the way out to the west, the south, right, and the east around you. And toward the north, you think you can see the ocean in the distance, but it might just be a mirage, right? That blue thin line, miles, tens and hundreds of miles to the north might just be a trick of the light of the sunless sky bouncing down from the horizon around you. And I think it's huddled up against this cavern with a little bit of a smoke blowing from a low bonfire uh, all over this space is where we find Jaron. Jaron, what are you up to and what are you doing? I think Jaron is huddled up um, by this fire and they have sort of like their furs um, drawn up close to them and they're, uh, I want to say like squatting on the ground and they have a stick in their hand that they're using in order to write into the snow. So they're like writing into the snow and they're practicing, I think they're two specifically. Um, they don't have anyone really to practice with. Uh, like Gentle can understand all languages, but that doesn't mean that Gentle can like speak all languages. So I think two is one of the ones that they can't. And so Drone is kind of like trying to practice two alone, essentially, just like writing out like different exercises, like vocab and stuff into the snow and kind of like mumbling to themselves as they do it. Mm. And I think it's upon this scene that we find you, Abiku. I think Abiku is, I, I am like, I'm like walking and I like stop and look and I'm like, that almost looks right. Almost? Wait, you speak too? Uh, is that what you call it? And I start speaking Ba. <laughs> How much of that do does Jaron actually understand? Like, is there any part of it that feels familiar? It would be like if someone's randomly started speaking like ancient Greek to a mo modern Greek person, right? Or like Latin to someone who knows English. It's like you kind of recognize it, but it sounds super, super old. And it takes you a minute to realize that it's a dead tongue. Whoa, a, a piku. It's called two. No, that's not two. What language is that? I don't know. Nobody knows it. I don't. The doctor didn't know what to call it. That's fascinating. I've. It sounds like a odd mishmash of specific languages that we currently speak, but I've never heard anything like it. I, Abiku, I think that might be one of the dead languages in in Andake, actually. Uh, that would make sense because I am dead. Yeah, fair, fair enough, fair enough. Do you, do you think? And I think like Jaron kind of like 
gets a little bit, like, scoots a little bit closer to Abiku. And I imagine if Abiku is standing, this is kind of a comical image of, like, drawn, yeah, like, squatting it's on the ground. Yeah, Abiku's not knelt down yet. She's definitely standing. <laughs> and Abiku's just, like, towering over, over him. And Jaron just kind of looks up, and they have this, like, glimmer in their eyes. Like, they are so excited by this prospect. And they look up at Abiku, and they say, Would you be willing to teach me some of it? You, Just words here and there. You think I could teach you something? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that language, and you clearly speak it so fluently without even thinking about it, so... Please? I could, I could, if you're interested into, I could try and... I mean, I'm not fully fluent in it yet, so maybe a different language would be better, but I can try and teach you something back if you'd like. It took the doctor like a, a few months of me studying all day to learn to learn this, to learn, to learn the common. So, I you can try. I do not like to study. That's fair enough. Do you like to teach? I don't know. I've never done it. No one has asked me to teach them anything before. At least I don't remember. I I guess I was a high-ranking military officer. I probably had to t- teach people how to like shoot and like stab and you know, steal things and such. This won't be that different from that, probably. Okay, I don't remember that. I'm just sure I did. It just seems like a thing you would do when you are, like, second in command. Come. And Jaron, like, hand, like, holds out the stick for Abiku. He grabs the top of the stick like we're playing a game. Jaron's gonna let go once you have, once you have the stick. Come. Okay. Okay. Uh, so how, how do I say, I guess we should start with the basics. How do I say hello? Oh, okay. And then she'll start like writing stuff out in the snow. <laughs> yeah. And I think, uh, Jaron will like get like really, really close to Abiku and like almost like peering over her shoulder, even though like, he good luck. Really <laughs> <laughs> trying to, trying to see, and he'll kind of like point out like, Wait, okay, so, like, and when Ibiku starts to write out, like, full sentences, uh, Jaron will be like, okay, so the past participle is here, and it doesn't go with at the end of the sentence? I don't know what that means, but yes, that's how your sentence works. Okay, wow, that's fascinating, you know? You know, that actually feels like it has raven speech influences here. I do like to talk to birds, that makes sense. Wait, do you speak raven speech? And Jaron will start, like, speaking in raven speech at Abiku. I cast speak <laughs> Does it work? Does it work? <laughs> it so- it's like two different dialects, right? <laughs> <laughs> Is this, like, Mandarin and Cantonese? Yeah, like? yeah, a little bit. Like, you're t- it's the same language, two completely different ways of speaking it. <laughs> <laughs> you speak Raven speech? Oh yeah, I can talk to birds. <laughs> I think to anyone else who's like outside of this conversation, just, you just hear the two of them like you're chirping and cawing. Yeah, yeah. I think Rev is on the other side of the camp, leans into V and says, Jerome's speaking in Raven speech, Abiku's just squawking. You know, surprise that's not very surprising, surprisingly. That seems on brand. Very on brand. Would they look like they're having fun, at least? I don't like to see Jaron having fun, but I guess it's fine for now. Well, it's, you know, it's the calm before the storm. Let them have their one last meal before we uh, get to the Chromium Order. You're right. You're right. Well, I'm not hoping for disaster, but if it strikes, you know, have it strike Jaron, right? <laughs> if it's gotta hit somebody, you know, dead weight. Mm. And then we pan back to Abiku and Jaron. So, I, I don't I know what you are saying. You are doing it wrong, I think. I talk to birds all the time. And I think uh, Jaron will uh, mimic back the sounds that Abiku is making back at her. Jaron doesn't know what the heck he's saying, but he can very accurately mimic it back. Yes, the, there is a lot of snow that you go. Oh, is that is that what I said? Yes. Maybe, maybe after, after we're done learning this language, maybe you could also teach me how to speak 
Bur- avian bird? What's the correct? I I don't. They don't name it anything. They are just birds. They just talk. Maybe maybe we could do that afterwards. And I think Jaron okay. like goes back to to the to the snow writing and like starts to uh, practice out like some of the other languages. Ah. And we just kind of like go back and forth there for a while. I like that a lot. I think that's a really sweet way to like, uh, like wrap up that scene, right? As like Rev sort of shakes her head and leans into V, watching the two of you teach each other languages. Uh, I think another <laughs> flurry of snow wipes away the scene, and we find ourselves yet again on these two dog sleds, like riding and charging and hoofing our way across the snowy prairie toward the northern reaches of the commune. And we, we've been traveling for almost a week now at this point. And I think on the dawn of the, let's say, seventh day, it's about midday, uh, approaching evening, that's when the four of you see it. A mountain rising up from the distance, the rough size and shape of a thumb pressed against the horizon. The headquarters of the Chromium Order. And I think as all of you see it, we're going to cut to break. Uh, so we will be back in 10 minutes, everybody. Uh, enjoy the fan art reel. Enjoy. Go take a break. Do your thing. We'll be back in 10. We love you so much. Uh, Pijo, Pijo. Hello, 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 Transplaner friends and family. GM Connie here with a very exciting word from one of our incredible sponsors for Arc 6 of the Second Stranger. Roll is an alternative to complex virtual tabletops instead serving as a people-first online play and creation platform for TTRPGs and all sorts of social narrative play. With a focus on high-quality video, intuitive code-free creation tools, and simple, seamless gameplay for everyone, Roll is the easiest place for you to run your games online. Also, with Roll's drag and drop sheet builder system, you can create content for any game you want to play, even your own homebrew hacks. Tell the stories you want to tell, Roll empowers you to do so. Also, Roll is 100% free for anyone to use all the time. So sign up today and run your next game at playroll.com. Roll, you can play with us.
Welcome, welcome, welcome back, everyone. We are looking adorable, delicious, red, red delicious right now. Uh, welcome back to Transplaner. We'll hop right back into Arc 6, Episode 4. Before we do, some content warnings uh, for this episode may include fantasy violence, body horror, gore, monsters and monstrosity, death of loved ones, apocalypse, trauma and grief, familial struggles, medical experimentation, references to torture, bodies of water, heights, Complex and complicated relationships, flirting and romance, and references to sexual entanglements. And with that out of the way, let's hop right back in. V, Abiku, and Jaron. You see this lumbering hulk of a mountain on the distance. It will take you at least the rest of the day to get to it, you figure, at this pace. But now that the Chromium Order's headquarters are actually in sight, your mission is beginning to feel even more tangible, even more real. And I think it's at this point that Rev on one of the sleds turns back to face your group. Sort of <clears throat> a feathered cape ruffling in the wind, hunkers down and says, Is it, uh, is it time? Should we start thinking of a plan? Oh, you're just starting to think about a plan? I've been sitting here this whole time thinking about plans. I was just trying to open the conversation, V. Obviously, I've also been thinking about plans, but I figured maybe we should share and brainstorm, etc. I have not been thinking about a plan, if it makes you both feel better. Um, That's okay, I, you. I wasn't really expecting you to think of a plan oh. in advance. It's, it's fine. Okay. I could distract them. I am good at that. We, it's not come up before. What kind of distraction were you thinking? I, like I said, I had not thought of a plan before this. I just am good at distracting people. We just have, the last thing I did with you was like fight a giant tall shadow man and he did not need to be distracted. Well, the Chromium Order has a particular interest in dragons and Abiku, you have a particular knowledge, first-hand account of I know dragons. A lot, I know like three things about dragons, yes. Three things that they probably don't know. Um, so I feel like using that information as leverage might actually, might actually be useful. I'm also very pretty. That is true. The Kagan would certainly agree. I'm sorry, the Kagan? Like, like, <laughs> <Be like Kogan? laughs> I'm just going to put it out there that, um, my presence might stir the pod more than we want it to be stirred, so maybe it's best if I maybe disguise myself a little bit. Right, you can just use your magic, right? Yeah, I'll just dis disguise myself and uh, that'll be it. We'll be fine. Okay. And, I mean, maybe I can ask for a tour, see the Didn't tapestry, I, and that Can't could... you, like, sneak, you said? You said you wanted to sneak? I can, I can do that as well, yes. That's what, I can distract them and you can, like, go through a... Do they have windows? They, everyone has windows, right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, excuse me. Do that. Do you know if the Chromium Order has any windows? And the Minotaur guy is like, I don't. I don't know. They're across a lake. I've never been across the lake before. They're they're across a lake. We're we're on a lake. Well, we're on a massive lake. There are lots of other lakes on top of Zima Lake. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you've never been to the Commune before. All right. Fuck that guy. Get um, a low to her, right? What is this? You trying to build camaraderie here between the two of us? What's my name? Jeff. Can I roll to remember? Can I roll to the remember? The just says Jeff. Name? <laughs> Jeff. No. I would like to roll to remember. Okay, roll intelligence. It's gonna be okay. a DC twenty-seven. Oh my it's god! Got intelligence okay. history check. <laughs> We've never okay, once okay, asked okay, this okay, person's okay, name. Okay, okay. <laughs> While you're rolling, I just my I have a background feature I've never used, which is all eyes on me. So. <laughs> Oh, nice. People just, people just think I'm weird and want to talk to me and look at me. I rolled an 18. It's something starting with a B. That's all you can remember. Fuck! Beth. <laughs> Breath. What? Not Jeff? even close. Ben, I'm, ben I'm not even going to tell you anymore at this point. Just forget it. To be Mush. fair, I don't remember my whole life, so it's not personal that I don't remember your name. Jaron is <laughs> having a flashback to the Buck scenario. <laughs> <laughs> Rev turns back to your party and says, Anyway, so Abiku, you're going to run distraction. Jaron, you're going to sneak in slash sidle your little weasel face in. Uh, v, you'll disguise yourself and also sneak in. And I and Costas, I suppose we can also sneak in. Seems like a good plan to me, right? I'm... Costas is not good with people. 
they, they should not be part of that plan. Yeah, no, I, uh, <clears throat> I don't feel comfortable lying directly to people's faces, mostly because I'm bad at it. So if I can just like, not talk, that'd be great. It is hard because they are so beautiful. People want to talk to them. What? It, what no, sh- shut up, Apiku. No, I'm not. But you can just be, you know, the strong, silent type in the back. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I can do That's that. That's more yeah. attractive, anyway. What? How would you? What? Shut up! I don't care, huh? <laughs> I love Custis. Biku looks down at you, Jaron. Hmm. In what way? <laughs> what is the expression on Abiku's face? Like, is this threatening? The ex- is this... the ex- the expression is I'm watching you. That's my brother. What? I mean, it's true. Turns away. Anyway, <laughs> all of you make a deck save. <laughs> oh God! What? <laughs> How dare you? Driver bucks us off. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sick of this. I got a nat one. Oh, keep it, go. keep it, keep it. I'll give you an inspo Bye. if you do. Okay. I only got an eight. Okay. Uh, I am nimble like the breeze. Uh, 16 plus nine is a math number. Whoa, 25. that is a 25. I also have plus nine. This, I should theoretically be nimble as the breeze. <laughs> 10, that okay. That was a nat one. Abiku, the hairs on the back of your neck stiffen. Uh, a split second before the monster explodes out of the ice directly underneath you. Uh, It is a mass of just, there's a massive, it's huge. It's a huge monster. Uh, You notice a massive shell, like huge with like serrated edges, like a long, I think like wrinkled neck, like a turtle tortoise's neck extending out of the front and like a a face that's sort of like a, a snout contorted with like sharp snarling teeth and these huge, I think like claws, like just scrabbling out of the ice and wrapped around this huge tortoise, it appears, is a uh, body is a black snake, uh, thick and wiry, like a band of living oil, just entwined around like the bottom of its shell, over the top of it, back around the bottom, back over the top, and the snake also has like a snarling kind of face, like a head going on. It just explodes and punches out of the ice underneath you, uh, sending like the sled, flying the dogs, like skidding across the ice, like the Minotaur driver goes flying through the air. Uh, Jaron and V also go, you just go, you, you just fly like through the air, but Abiku, you're able to catch yourself. How do you do that? I think she, she, cause she keeps a few like normal arrows look like a normal archer. You know, she doesn't use them. I think she just like digs two arrows into whatever will keep her from flying. I don't know if it's a sled or the ground or, mm. and like they would snap cause they're just like normal arrows. But I think it's like enough to like, instead of flying, she has the cool like action hero slide thing. Totally. Yeah. I think the force of this tortoise with a snake wrapped around its body like still punches you up into the air but you land gracefully on your feet and you drag those two arrows like through the ice like and you skid to like a really cool superhero looking landing uh but v you tumble through the air and you smack i think against like a a frosty boulder uh and like you feel your bones crack like the wind gets knocked out of your body and jerron you, get, you, you fly through the air, but instead of landing on the ground, uh, the snake's head whips around through the air and grabs you by the midriff. And now you're just like in the middle of the snake's mouth being like flung through the air. That's how huge this creature is, right? It's like as big as a building, probably. Uh, maybe slightly smaller than a building, but it's a, it's a huge creature. It's like 15 feet tall. And I need all of you to roll initiative. I was just having a good time. I was on a road. We were having a great friends. time. We were making plans. We weren't. <laughs> we were even like kind of being nice to Jaron for a second. <laughs> Not I even. Forgot they were... <laughs> Not even. Okay, I got a fourteen. I got a twenty-four. Choo! I got a nineteen. Okay. Four. Damn. V yeah, at cool. the at the very top of your turn. I need you to take some damage from slam against this boulder, you are going to take 24 points of bludgeoning damage and other 9 points of cold damage. Uh, I am resistant to cold. Great, so that is going to be 4 points of cold damage. Okay, got it. Alright, so V cracks against the rock, she falls on the ground, and she's 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 got the wind knocked out of her, so she's, she's like trying to stand up enough and like just trying to breathe and she like sees the thing. So she's, she doesn't have much control of anything so she's just i think for this first move <laughs> let's just go with immolation she's just gonna 
throw a wave of magic at the creature, so it has to make a dexterity save against uh, 15 or, or be erupted into flameries. Okay, this thing's not very dexterous. Wait, 17. <laughs> sorry, it's 17 now. It's 17 is the dex save. I'm so happy I've been using an online dice roller because I got a nat 20. <laughs> Uh, again, okay. like the both times I've used with your group, I've gotten a nat 20. Uh, so, okay, here's how I'll resolve it. Tell me what the magic looks like. So, uh, V is going to just whip her hand at it, and it's like this um, green fireball just flies out of her palm and, like, hits the creature. And it's still going to take some damage, but the successful save sort of, like, normally would... It would start, like cracking green around it and then explode into flames but because it did save uh it probably doesn't do that but that's what the the attempt is to try to do does it still take half damage on a on a success it does take half damage okay so roll roll damage and i'll tell you how the nat 20 resolves so 14. uh so we see this like wave of green fire erupt out of V's hand and just shatter against this tortoise snake's body and like bits of flame lick past you, Jaron. But as it phases through you, you don't feel hurt at all. And this thing just sort of lets out a from its like t tortoise mouth and the snake's mouth is full of Jaron so it doesn't say anything. But as a reaction with its nat 20, the, s the black liquid oil-like snake just sort of waves through the air and pummels Jaron against against the ice like a ragdoll. So, Jaron, you are going to take uh, 21 points of bludgeoning damage and 7 points of piercing damage from the fangs and 11 points of poison damage from the fangs. Uh, Jaron, you just feel it's... I think how this resolves is it pu like pummels you several times against the ground like a... And like we just see Jaron's hair like flying all over the place right? just like limp limbs going everywhere and v is that the end of your turn yeah i think I, I spend the rest of my sort of movement to like just stand up and use the rest of my turn to just like catch my breath okay totally because you were i think prone slumped against this boulder make me a nature check a nature check oh dear <laughs> i'm gonna take it and that one <laughs> to you this thing Mmm. Okay, even with your nat one, you can feel the weave around this thing bend and, like, stiffen and tighten and contort. Uh, like, this thing is brimming with magical energy. But with your nat one, I think you just see a giant turtle and a giant snake, and you're like, holy fuck, a giant turtle snake, and let's kill this thing, right? Like, that's all you really see with a nat one. Uh, but with that, we're gonna pass things over to a Biku. I think, given who you are, at the top of your turn, I want you to make the same nature check. Sure. Na natural 20 for 26. <laughs> That's beautiful. Okay. You have taken a beat to assess the situation here, right? Your two arrows dug into the ice, seeing Jaron fly all over the place, getting punched into the ice, like V throwing gouts of green flame at this thing. And you know immediately what it is. You recognize it. You feel the magic brimming off of its body. This thing is an emissary. Uh, and I think with your natural 20, you recognize the exact kind of emissary it is. In fact, Dr. Aluso had told you stories about this emissary once in order to pass the time right at their cottage when teaching you how to, how to speak. Uh, this thing is Xuan Wu, the black tortoise. Uh, it is an emissary of Nitbuza that protects the frigid north as a benevolent guardian spirit. Uh, and with your nat 20 okay. nature check, it looks, there's something wrong with it. Yes. Like it looks frenzied. It's not acting like itself. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay. Um, the, that answers my question. The, the turtle and snake are one being. They are one being. It is okay. the black tortoise. It's not like, okay, yep. the, okay it's the, the snake's not like hurting the Okay. All right, stay with me here. So, I have Dominate Beast, but can I make it, like, Be Happy Beast? <laughs> like, can I, like, dominate it to, like, make it, not make it happy, but to, like... Calm like, it down? But, like, like we, I can talk to you, like, let's, mm -hmm. like, let's, like, but I, you have to, like, not want, make me think you're going to, like, put me in your mouth and throw me 30 miles away. 
Sure. So what kind of role is that for Dominate Beast with that flavor? It, it would need a wisdom saving throw. DC okay. is only 17. I'm not like a real spellcaster. Well, it rolled a four. Got him. <laughs> so it's a, I think, OK, so it's like a Biku like stands up and she like sees like she sees like V like throwing fire and drun like being fl- and like Rev's probably like getting ready to do badass like scythe shit, like throwing her scythe. And I'm just like, everyone, V, Colton, I'm going to try something here. Um, it's a little hard to be calm, Abiku. You will be at one second. You'll be quiet. Uh, and I think um, Abiku t- picks up some of the snow again because that's like where she is. And she's, she like, walks over and it starts uh, like glowing with her magic. And she's like, I I am friends with the, with, with the person carrying your god. I have not spoken with them directly, but... Uh, she liked me, and the godshard liked her, so I was wondering if you could give me a chance for you to like me, and you can show us what is wrong here. And she walks, she like walks up to this thing with like this like snow on her hand. Mm. You, you walk up to the you... edge of where the surface of the frozen lake has burst open, right? Like it's, yeah. it was in the water underneath you, right? And like you see just feet, like a dozen feet of just a, a thick layer of ice all the way down, and like dark watery depths underneath and like two of its like front hooves are like on the ice the rest of its body still kind of in in the snow and the water and Jaron's getting mm-hmm. flung all over the place above its head right and it's mm-hmm. like kind of like frenzied eyes of this like tortoise are like looking all around it looks sort of like um dissociated right like its eyes aren't focused and its mouth mm-hmm. is sort of frothing with like a kind of black foam and it's just sort of like mm-hmm. blearily looking around as you address it um you you are a protector, and I understand maybe we have done something wrong and don't realize it. So if you would take this, it it would let us talk to each other and you can let me know what is going on because uh, it does have we form a telepathic link. So, ooh, OK, so you're offering the snow up to this creature, yeah. to the black tortoise. Do you like blow the snow up toward it or do you offer for it to eat? I like offer like when you offer a horse an apple, like flat. <laughs> Okay, I think because it failed its save, its eyes sort of focus. Its eyes are sort of like runny and black, mm-hmm. right? Like a f- mm-hmm. thin, like white film has clouded over its over its pupils, and it's like this tortoise head, like sort of turns in the air, right? Like in this oblong, crooked way, and then it looks down, and its eyes fix upon the snow in your hands, and in a horrifying single swoop, its neck shuts down toward you. For like a half a second, you're like, is this thing gonna pummel me to death with its head? But it stops short, like just like a a foot in front of your hand and it opens up its like slobbering mouth. You see these sharp, rending teeth in this tortoise's mouth and it (sighs) takes a big bite of the snow and lifts its giraffe long neck up and just swallows. And it shakes its head and you see some of like the thick film that's rhymed over its eyes like melt off. And for a split Mm -hmm. second, you see clarity flicker back into its expression and it juts its gaze down at you again. And you feel its voice reverberate around inside your body telepathically, Abiku. And its voice sounds like it's coming to you through a thick pane of glass. Like there's something Mm -hmm. blocking the connection between the two of you. Right. And the voice of this emissary rings out and in Ba, it speaks to you and it says, Oh, hero, the pain, the pain of its and you feel just suffering like absolute abject pain just blazing through every nerve, every soul strand, tying this black tortoise together. It is in so much pain right now. There's something corrupting it. It's trying to talk to you, but it can't form coherent sentences because of whatever's within it, right? Even with dominant beasts, that's what you can find out. Can I use the link we have to try and take whatever is going on from it? I understand I could be risking my Abiku understands it could be risking yourself, but like the, she's like this thing is way more important than me. This is like a god's emissary. Mm. Mm. Okay. Are you trying to do it psychically, like through the link? Yeah. She. If I'm like t- connected to it telepathically, like I don't have like a, I only do like soul stuff, like some of the, like, sure. some of the other 
people. I, I don't have like any kind of mind powers outside of this. So she's like, while I have this connection to it, can I like push myself to try and take this from it, even if it means giving it to myself? So Abiku, with all that considered, I want you to make a spell casting check. Okay, so I roll a d20 for sure. And do I add yeah. my modifier? Yes, you add your spellcasting ability modifier plus your proficiency bonus. Okay. Okay, that's not bad. 27. 27. With a 27, tell me how you're trying to hold on to this psychic connection between yourself and the black tortoise. I think she... So I'm a very physical, very literal person, so I think this, like, connection, talking to each other, like, mind palacing, like, a Biku, we're, we're, like, there. And I think the strands connecting is Biku literally, like, grabs. Uh, or in her mind's eye, right, she's, like, grabbing these strands, and it's like, I am not letting you go. Okay. In your head, we see the sort of, like, psychic version of a Biku grabbing onto these strands of psychic mm -hmm. thought and connection of uh, between yourself and the black tortoise and then we see whatever like thick pain whatever barrier was between the two of you begin to crack and seeping through the barrier in your mind's eye abiku as you're sort of both in the now and in like a psychic other plane that you know facilitates the conversation between you and this emissary you see black liquid begin to seep through the cracks, plop onto the ground of your subconscious and begin to pull around your feet and sink their way into your skin and up your body. And in the now, we see a Biku sort of rooted in place, like frozen, looking up at this black tortoise, who the tortoise part is frozen and staring down at a Biku. And uh, we see, I think, I think V sees this most prominently. Jerron, you can make a perception check because they're currently being flung through the air. So let's see how successfully you see this. 21. You see it as well. Uh, in the snatches of lucidity you have before being pummeled onto the earth, you and V see thick veins begin to creep up the sides of this tortoise's neck uh, with this kind of like black liquid uh, pummeling through its like vacuous tunnels, right? And this like, this black vein veining begins to seep up its throat up to its head uh, and as it does we also see the same black veins begin to creep up a biku's uh legs in tandem yes Jeron. do those black veins resemble at all what happened to Jeron last arc in dabathati because it's if you remember, very similar it's extremely okay. similar yeah yeah, okay. you, you you can feel that this is empty magic at work here, right? Uh, a Biku, I think that's all that Dominate Beast can do. Do you have any other actions or movements you'd like to do? No, if anything, I would like try to get closer to this thing. It's one yeah. its head's like 15 feet in the air or something, right? Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I can't. I would, yeah, I would like, I would try and get closer to its head, but it's in the sky. I can't fly, so no. And I think, like, whatever psychic connection you're trying to use to, to breach whatever corruption has taken root over this emissary's consciousness is rooting you to the spot. Like, you physically, it's physically okay. very difficult for you to move. Um, okay. But I think if you want to sustain this connection, you can try to break through the glass, so to speak, uh, the next time our turn loops around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get there. Yeah. Okay. So now we go to Jerron. Can Jaron see that the black veins are creeping up on a Biku as well, or just that it's on the creature, on the black tortoise? You can see both. Okay. <sighs> okay. Jaron is being flung around as well, and I think that the pain of being smashed against the ice of the lake is what uh, captures his attention at first, but then seeing those black veins, he is kind of honed in on that. And they remember that this is empty magic. This is the corrupting influence of maybe not necessarily Adam here, but at least the same kind of thing about the chrysalis, the stranger. And they kind of, they have a thought where they think they might be able to coax that out of the black tortoise and out of a biku. And they kind of have a moment where they're hesitating between, do I try it? Do I not? Last time I tried it, things went terribly. And I think he's scared of hurting Abiku. 
in the same way. So he kind of like wrestles with that for a bit and I think eventually makes the decision that Abiku's life is and this emissary's life needs to be saved. And so he will very hesitatingly, very reluctantly slip into Adam's voice and command this bl these black veins to release both Ibiku and the tortoise. Make a performance check. I got a 19. Total? Total. Okay. Uh, as you're being flung through the air, you sort of shout in Adam's voice. What are the exact words that leave your mouth? Oh, I have to be so careful about this. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> Release a biku and the emissary. Okay. You see the black veins on both of their bodies, the neck of the emissary and the calves of a biku just surge up like very suddenly and pour out uh, from a biku's eyes, nose, mouth, ears, and also the eyes and the nostrils and like the big fang teeth of the tortoise itself. Right? Like this black ooze just sort of dribbles out of both of their bodies and splashes and puddles and pools onto the icy ground. Oddly enough, sizzling the ice as soon as it makes contact with the earth. And this kind of pungent, toxic, acrid, acidic smell begins to sort of slip through the atmosphere around you. And a biku. From your perspective, the glass pane that you see shatters. And as soon as it shatters, the connection between you and the emissary severs as well. Uh, but it, it doesn't feel like something brutal has severed it. It feels like a release, right? As it shatters, like it's no longer carrying this thick thing congealing through its soul. And as you your eyes fling open, you see this thing reel backward. And the big, the snake that was holding on to you, Jaron, like stops thumping you against the ground, actually, and you feel the fangs, like, loosen around your body, and it slowly lowers you to the ground and lets go, right? But you've got, like, puncture wounds, I think, on your body, and you're all bruised up to hell and back. And this massive tortoise, half out of the water, half still in the crevasse, just, like, shakes its head, right? Uh, almost like it's coming out of a stupor. What happened to the, the, the black ichor that spilled out of Ibiku and the tortoise? It's still there. It's alive. Uh, like, and a Biku, I think you get a real nasty flashback for like half a second to the Black Star, right? Of just like this living mass, this living three dimensional asterisk that you were impaled upon for like half a second. It's just like living goo, right? It's like liquid tar black blood or something just sort of pooling uh, around a Biku and the tortoise. I, if I'm allowed to do something next, um, I think V recognizing this, um, would dimension door to like right next to all this ooze and um i think i'd like to try to plane shift this ooze to back to the nothing plane hopefully oh okay what kind of a save is that that's a charisma save okay and you're trying to con you're trying to specifically open up a connection between now and the nothing plane yep to send this creature into it Okay, I'll Which make I'm guessing it's save. an unwilling. Yes, it will be unwilling. I also need you to make a spell casting check. Sure. So that is a 33. <laughs> okay. What is the DC for resisting plane shift? 17. Okay. So I think what happens is. What does it look like as you try to pull the nothing plane here or like open up an aperture into it? I think um, the veins all over these body glow intensely, the purple glowing purple, the green glowing green, uh, eyes like searchlights and V just sort of um, one hand that's glowing green is like opening. You just see this green sort of burning the fabric of reality a little bit, opening into this darkness, which uh, you can't really see anything in. And then like the other hand, which is glowing like a strong purple is sort of like grabbing the goo or like just touching the goo. And it's like slowly turning purple. And he's gonna try to just like lift it up with this purple energy and, and fling it into this rip in fabrics of space and time. So, 
So V, I don't think it's physically possible for you to tear open a portal into the nothing when there is nothing else around you to facilitate that. Because the previous few times that this has happened, the first one was when you were facing off against Kilohana, a priestess of the empty, and she had that connection there. So you were, she was sort of ambiently emitting magic that allows you to tap into it. The other time we saw it happen with our party was during the Chrysalis Conference, when Adam was trying to pull the Chrysalis into the now. Here, there is neither Adam nor Kilohana. The only connection to the nothing plane you could fathom would be this black goo here that you're trying to use as a conduit or an anchor to call back into its name of plane. So with a 33, it, res it, it successfully resisted the plane shift, but you, with your 33, were able to keep a stable grasp over your magic, so the consequences of your actions will be limited here. Uh, you're in a controlled position. But as you rip at the weave, V, you don't open up a portal. You, 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 your hands tear and form these like four slashes into, I think, the fabric of reality. But instead of seeing void black nothing, right, instead of just seeing like the swirling emptiness of the nothing plane, you see, uh, for a flash of a second before the rips seal up, a woman's face. A uh, pallid skin, this kind of like limp, blonde hair hanging in front of her. Uh, these kind of like pale blue eyes that look like watercolored blues that have been like diluted to its like barest components. And just like these dark circles underneath her eyes. She looks so tired. This is the most tired woman you've ever seen in your life. And she's barely 30 years old. She's got like the, the you see like a, a starched stiff collar and like a tie. And she, her eyes like are facing away from you as you tear this like hand large aperture open. But then her eyes flick and meet yours for half a second. And she cocks her head to the side in interest, and you see like the bottoms of her exhausted eyes curl up with a smirk. And then the tear closes up, right? Like a wound accelerating its healing process and just gums over. And this like vibrating massive empty ichor continues to thrum and hum and gyrate and, and gelatinize itself on the ground as your attempt to throw it into the nothing plane fails. Oh dear. Um, I think that catches V completely off guard. Not what she was expecting at all. And I think she almost like stumbles like dangerously close into the substance. Like I think her hand that was like glowing purple in it um, is still in it. And I, it's probably even like starting to try to climb up her arm. Um, mm. And she was like so shocked by that, that she's kind of a little bit stupefied. But that was yeah, not no. at all part of the plan. Definitely. And I think we're out of initiative now. Like this, we're no longer in combat against the emissary. Go ahead, Jaron. I think um, Jaron is kind of uh, shaking a little bit because he doesn't like going into Adam's voice anymore. It kind of makes them feel like at, like not themselves, and so they're just kind of like breathing kind of heavily there, um, half here and half not. Just kind of like I hate doing that. I hate doing that. And then, like after. A few moments will try and like compose himself and looking over at uh, Abiku will like run over to Abiku wherever she is and say are you okay? I don't know we need to kill that thing and I point at the goop and I think Jaron is kind of like like didn't fully notice that the like goo is like still here and that V is like trying to open a portal to the nothing plane V what are you doing um, and he will uh, turn around and look at the goo and say right oh, right um, and Jaron doesn't actually have Kane's dagger on them on their person anymore because they gave it too gentle so I think um, instead, what they do is they pull out their short bow and like having like ran like away from the goo a little bit, I think we'll just try and try and knob an arrow at it. Uh, as you knock an arrow in your short bow and you like tighten, tighten, tighten the string against it, all of you just see a massive tortoise hoof like 
rise into the air and this emissary just stomps, like just absolutely crushes it like a slug, like underfoot and bam. And you see like ambient bits of like goo fly through the air, right? And they like splatter, (laughs) they splatter Uh, against like the snow. Oh, yes, uh, Abiku like kneels, like I was in like a prayer position. Um, thank you for your help, Emissary. I'm sorry it took us so long to save you. The black tortoise, Abiku, sort of lowers its massive, like, giraffe-long neck down to your party in, like, a gesture of gratitude, right? As it sort of, like, uh, smears the rest of this, like, empty goo across the ice as it, its, like, knees bend down and its hooves sort of part. And you see its, like, snake head as well also lowers and, like, blinks its big viper-like eyes at your party. Uh, and all of you here, in... Not any language that exists, but just in words that you understand intrinsically, telepathically ringing through your mind. Uh, All of you hear this emissary speak to you, words of gratitude. Thank you for freeing me of this pain and corruption. It is the least we can we could do. You do we we owe you thanks. You did kill it, and you've are a protector. So thank you for doing your best to fight it. A protector brought low. I have not suffered such humiliation my entire life. I must offer apologies. Oh, do not think about it. We all have bad days. For myself, t'was not a matter of bad days, more so a matter of bad years. Years and years of pain and suffering wrought unto me by mortal hands. What... What happened, if you don't mind me asking? Maybe we can stop it from happening again? My memory shatters like glass against ice, and yet I perceive glimpses of truth. A facility to the south. Heat and steam and pumping gears, this black ichor, its name. A pregnant pause as the emissary attempts to recollect the name for the substance, for this goo. And then it it seems to click and it says, Mother's blood burns the nerves, scorches the soul, addles the mind. Uh, Wait, I... Mother's blood? A, I, I kind of look back at, like, at the, probably V. It, does that mean anything to you? I feel like mother is something you have talked about before. It's a yes. Karagun thing? The URL referred to the stranger and all of this stuff as being con- worked on by mother. That's what they called. Dr. Singh called it mother. So... I'm sorry, your, your emissary. So, people came here and took you to the self and put this goo inside you? Fractured ghosts of memories. I do remember being captured, fought, dominated as you tried to commune with myself, but in ways more forceful and violent that I think you have gumption to attempt. They overtook me, brought me to the south, addled my soul with mother's blood, and released me back here. For what purpose I know not, only pain. Yes, of course. This is very troubling. Do you do you remember if other emissaries were there? My brethren, my siblings, yes, yes, it comes back 
to me now like forgotten threads on a winter song. Yes, other emissaries far, far to the south, they cry out for help through the weave. I sense them, my brothers, the other cardinal directions. They are there. They need help. I look at I mean, we are busy now, but we can, we can let the others know when we can talk to the others. I guess we don't know where they are. It would be nice if we could contact Dewey. Dewey worked for the URL, and I wonder if he knows anything or saw anything about this section. It sounds like the URL. They are kidnapping emissaries? It would seem that way. I wonder if they are responsible for the emissary that attacked Oka all those years ago. That would mean that they've been up to this for a very long time. I mean, that's what Dr. O said, right? That this has been going on for quite some time. Like Abiku said, we've, 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 we're doing something right now. Let's finish that. Our other friends, I don't know what's happening with them in Jukai, but when they're done, we can go to the URL and we, if there are emissaries trapped there, we can free them. If there are experiments being done like this, we can stop it We can take care of all of that. Wait, you're, um, and uh, looking at Abiku, emissariness, um, is there, do you have a way of contacting people that may be magically concealed in some way? You. And the emissary's four eyes fall upon a Biku. You felt the barrier between us, didn't you? Like a thick yes. pane of winter glass. Yes, it was very concerning. A similar psychic, unseen, intangible, impregnable barrier surrounds that facility to the south. I could not call out to my siblings from here. Do you know what is happening there? And I point to the mountain fortress of the Crimean Order. I have not been home in many years. That is okay. I, I am sorry you had to live like that for so long, and I hope you get to rest now. I appreciate your words of comfort and warmth, oh young one. And this thing like lowers this both of its heads like down, 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 so they're level to you, Abiku. I, I she I, hmm? I kinda laugh when they call when they call me young. Oh I I think I am like ten thousand years old. I I might be younger than you still, but <laughs> a myriad is younger still for an emissary but I can sense you have an older soul. Shattered, torn apart, sundered across age, time, and space. I hope you find what it is you are looking for. Maybe. I know something about shattered memory, so you'll want to take it slow. You and I are not so different. Stewards of Endake, protectors of our natural realm, I have a favor to beseech you and your party. If you encounter any other emissaries such as myself, addled and corrupted by mother's blood, try to save us. Of, of course, it is, I will. I, I will not speak for others. I mean, I've saved an emissary before, so... Oh, see, we have an expert. Then we owe you gratitude in spades. It's the least that we can do, I think. I can sense your journey brings you farther north. You ask of what knowledge I hold of that citadel tucked away beyond the lake within that mountain. They harbor great magical secrets of their own. Tread with caution. We will heed those warnings, friend. Then peace be upon yourselves and your way. 
and the emissary begins to sink with like a mighty like wave of water washing out over the icy surface, right? Back into the depths of Zima Lake. Uh, that was wild, huh? Not something you experience every day in Endake, for sure. <clears throat> yeah, if we could <clears throat> avoid that, that would be good, I think. That was a weird thing you did. You can, like, talk to them? Yeah, what's with, um, that voice you did? Sounds awfully familiar to me. Y yes, gentle? Uh, yeah, since we were kids, John's been very good at mimicry, and sometimes it can be really helpful. Like... It just was. So that's like a monster voice. It's like how they talk to each other? <clears throat> um, a monster in some definitions of the term. Biku, how familiar are you with the chrysalis? Well, uh... Like for butterflies? Butterflies, but worse. Um... I think oh. empty butterflies, empty magic butterflies. They're a oh. they have they have a leader, Adam, who can control the empty beasts by just his voice. And well, I learned that if you can sound like Adam, you can do the same thing. And Sharon just kind of nervously looks over, like like his eyes keep darting over at V, but he can't maintain eye contact. Burning daggers from V's eyes. <clears throat> that, that's a good I, trick. I would prefer not to use it again, if that's okay. Oh, you didn't have to use it that time. I think I had it. That that's fair. I just I just didn't want you to 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 um. Die. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I was w willing to if I had to save someone, but thank you. You 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 don't have to hurt yourself to save me. That's the problem, though, isn't it, Ibiku? You hear that, right? You hear how that's the problem? No. Ibiku, from experience, that that conversation doesn't really stop happening. You'll get that one again. Okay. Yeah, Gentle's another one who uh, needs to learn the same lesson, I think. Not the only person here who apparently still needs to learn some lessons. Well, it builds those great frozen tits. What the fuck was that? Uh, your driver, the Minotaur, at this point has hoofed uh, their way over with all their sled dogs that have been flung away from the side of battle. <laughs> but th this entire time, he's just been running across the ice trying to get back to you. <laughs> Finally arrives, all the dogs are like looking extremely startled. Bud is among them, like looks really, like ears pinned back. What the, did you see that massive turtle with a snake wrapped around it? Oh, oh my gods! Let's get back on our sleds. I'm just gonna finish this, uh, you know, I've got a husband and, and kids back at home, so I, I'm eager to get back to them in one piece. You know what I mean? I mean, especially after the cataclysm, we, our family's gotta stick together. Do you know who the people are that you are taking? Do you know who we, uh, to where we are going? Or do we yeah, just- Yeah, the Chromium Order. Place? Okay. Abiku, okay. remember what the Elder told us, the Chromium Order is fantastic. They're wonderful. They're to be trusted. Meanwhile, I think V's casting message like, mm. Abiku, shh, don't. I, in my head, I'm like, oh, we are lying, so they are not worried for their lives like they should be. Okay. You see, Abiku just sees in V's eyes, like, in just the eyes, like a massive, like, shaking of the head, like, yeah, yeah. Yes, we are going on a tour to a very safe location. Uh, yeah, of, of course. I mean, unless you're, you know, a bunch of monsters, you know, because Chromium Order, they hunt monsters and stuff like that. Uh, well, I think we have enough time left in the sky. It's so hard to tell without, without Galtanger or the fucking stars anymore. But, uh, I think we've got enough time to, uh, get to the edge of Zalam's teardrop, uh, before nightfall. Uh, and I think, if I may spiel us out, by the time you reach your quarry, that mountain in the distance, right? Nightfall breaches the sunless sky. Your sled dogs, after running for several more hours, eventually skid to a halt, tongues lolling from sweaty mouths, and all of you see why. Here, the surface of Zima Lake cracks open. 
to reveal frigid water, dappled with foamy, brackish ice, extending for half a mile farther north before ending at the entrance to the Chromium Order. On the far shore, all four of you see frozen waves lurching up to kiss the feet of a mighty mountain stronghold. It's a perfect blend of artistic design and militaristic fervor. All of you see Jukan-style pagodas rising from frozen pillars alongside an impenetrable wall of iron. Stairs walkways and battlements all throughout the stronghold connect frigid terraces and at the very top of this chromium order stronghold half a mile away you see a sprawling temple complex a miniature palace fit for a king and on that, I think we are going to end our session for the day. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Arc 6, Episode 4, uh, the second session of our Morosi session. I've been your creative producer and GM, Connie. My pronouns are they, he, and she. You can find me on the internet at by Connie Chong, B-Y-C-O-N-N-I-C-H-A-N-G, namely TikTok, Twitter, Ko-Fi, and Itch. I'm going to pass along introductions up and over to Dare. Hi, I'm Dare. Uh, I wasn't here for long, but I'm great. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, you can find me on all parts of the internet at Dare to Dream RPG, D A R E, uh, the number two, D R E A M RPG. Um, I'm just uh, cute online a lot. So, yeah, uh, find me on TikTok, Twitter, Tumblr now. People have made fan art of me there. It's great. Uh, yeah, so find me on the internet all there. And I'm going to throw this down to Erica. Hi everybody, it's me, Erica. Uh, I played V's everything. This, I'm, I'm not lying at all, ever anymore. No more, no more lies. Not sure so. And uh, you can find me at Erica New Girl everywhere I exist on the interwebs and come hang out with me on Twitch sometime. I will obviously say something I will regret later. I'll pass it on to Humna. Yes, hello, hello. My name is Humna. I use any and all pronouns um, and I am a TTRPG performer. Uh, today I have been Jaron Adam Kader. Nope, that's not his middle name. We're don't say that ever again okay um, you can find me on twitter at hshahid underscore where i talk about all of the different projects i'm a part of um if you like what i do and you like me making bad decisions and character you should definitely come follow me i'm a part of a few different ap's uh so yeah and i will pass it up and over to austin there we go hey everybody i'm austin my pronouns are he they she you can find me on twitter at sales that's at sailor sct austin I am a narrative and game designer. I'm a podcaster. I'm a performer. I'm someone with very strong opinions about King of the Hill because mul I contain multitudes. Uh, I just got done playing a Biku. I, I can handle corruption Ishtar. Um, that's really it. Follow me on Twitter. I talk about podcasts, talk about projects I'm writing on. Talk about my favorite King of the Hill episodes. That's kind of what you, you might be confused because of the Sailor Scout thing, but I have a very strong opinion that Hank Hill is a magical girl. So find me on Twitter. You can find out more about that. That's cursed. Uh, so tune in next week for Arc 6, Episode 5, the next Jukan session. Wow, our Jukan group trapped in a loop? It rhymes. Uh, we'll see what's happening with them. See you Saturdays at 7 p.m. U.S. Central Time. That's 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific. We love you all so much. We're now going to raid someone. So use the raid message in chat. Even if you can't stick around, Sage Transplaner sent you rep the brand. We love you. Follow their stuff if you like it. Uh, Shpisho, Pisho, till next week.